Welcome to our discussion of 13th with Minorities for Medical Marijuana's Roz McCarthy and Eric Range. Um, if you didn't know, M4MM is one of our social justice partners. Uh, we are so honored to have these two powerhouse advocates um, share their point of view about 13th. Um, even if you didn't have a chance to watch the film, um, you're going to hear some really awesome insights, point of view, um, and I highly recommend watching the film if you haven't got a chance to. Want to give you a little background on Minorities for Medical Marijuana. Um, they're a nonprofit whose mission is focused on providing advocacy, outreach, research, and training as it relates to business, social reform, uh, public policy, and health and wellness in the cannabis industry. Um, we also wanted to give you a little background on our speakers. So Roz is the founder and CEO of M4MM. Um, she does incredible work um, and she's been recognized by High Times Magazine as one of the top 100 influence, influential people in cannabis. So welcome Roz. And then Eric, um, he's on the board of M4MM. He also has an extensive knowledge um, of the cannabis industry, uh, diversity issues, community engagement, and public policy. Um, today, they're going to be discussing 13th, um, a film by Ava DuVernay that explores the concept of justice, race, and mass incarceration throughout the United States. They're also going to be providing a cannabis um, industry point of view as well. Uh, during this uh, discussion, you can message Aliyah Dean any questions that you might have. Um, we will have about 15 minutes toward the end um, for you to ask our speakers questions. So uh, without further ado, I'll let Roz and Eric take it away. Thank you so much for joining us. Sorry, I had myself on mute. So thank you guys for having us. Uh, thank you Hawthorne um, for just even taking the opportunity uh, to encourage your internal work groups and your employees um, to watch this film. Um, it is a film that you know, um, it was tough, right? E? I, 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 it's it definitely was, tough, man. Uh, was, and, you know, but I go again, I want to say uh, kudos to uh, Olivia and Aaliyah, uh, you know, and, and from my understanding, we have both Hawthorne and uh, Scott's Miracle Grow here today. So, you know, just kudos to you all as a uh, as a um, uh, ERG and, and as an organization. Uh, to find this uh, to be important. So, you know, I, I think this is definitely uh, something that's cutting edge uh, and exciting. Uh, so I, I'm excited to be here and have this conversation. But yeah, you're right, Roz. This this film is is not the easiest films uh, to watch. In particular, uh, I think coming from the African-American perspective, you know, because it's something that, you know, for most of us, uh, is, is it hits very close to home. Uh, and it, it is very much a part of our everyday reality. So, uh, yeah, this was a tough one to watch, uh, but I think it's necessary. Uh, lots of great information um, and, and people can learn quite a bit about how we are, um, how we got to where we are today in, in this country. Yeah, exactly. So so I don't know, like, are we are we ripped? Are we talking about this with everybody? So, OK, great. So I would say, you know, first and foremost, <laughs> that one of the things that really the, the director of this fr this film is Ava uh, DuVernay. And if you guys have not, um, if you don't know who she is, she's a prolific director uh, in, in our modern film, um, you know, industry right now. Um, she's an African-American woman um, who has created lots of j films in different genres. But first and foremost, her budget for this film was only a million dollars. And the focus of the film was about the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment, again, emancipated slaves. But the question at the beginning of the film is, did it really emancipate us or did the 13th Amendment allow for what we know right now as modern, you know, modern day incarceration or the modern prison complex? Um, so that's kind of what the, 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 the genesis of the film, which I thought was great because you never lost sight of the focus of it was that we think in our minds, be it the African-American community, communities at large, <clears throat> 13th Amendment passed that it freed us from slavery. However, there was a component within that amendment said only if you have only if you have not been identified as a criminal. 
So let's let's go back. Uh, and e, if you want to talk about even from the fact that slavery was an economic issue among people that were slave owners, yeah. economically, people that were slaves, we were we were pushed around like currency. Right. And, and you could create value based on the number of slaves you had that was currency. In, in fact, in, in our constitution, we had a way of actually quantifying a person uh, in, in, you know, to that, or quantifying a asset, if you will, property. Um, that's where we get the whole three-fifths of a, of a person, right? Because if you were a slave, you were quantified. This is how they, from an economic standpoint, were able to calculate their value and their worth. Yeah. If you had X number of slaves, you can count them as three-fifths of a person. That's where that comes from. And so, you know, I, I, again, hats off to uh, uh, the director of the film. She did such a wonderful job, I thought, from a, a almost scientific. I mean, not even almost. It, it was very scientific in the way that she broke down uh, at every point uh, how we are experiencing a modern day slavery and is based on that 13th, uh, that, that, you know, individual clause in the 13th Amendment. Um, you know, and I know we'll talk about this later about some of the parallels with the cannabis industry, but it, it, it reminds me about the, uh, you know, the nuance of words, right? The nuance of words and the, and the nuance of public policy. And you and I get into this quite a bit, you know, in, in, in our roles with minorities for medical marijuana. The way that we write, you know, laws have both uh, uh, intended consequences and unintended consequences. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, those unintended consequences may may have been intentional as well. And, and I, I think we see uh, throughout history, even as we talk about the civil rights movement and, and the legislation that came out of there, we are still, you know, black people in this country at every fold are having to play in a political system that wasn't designed by us. But we have to become masters of it and recognize that every turn there's probably something hidden in the legislation that is so detrimental to us that we won't know for decades to come. So, and, and so just to interrupt you, there was a part in the film and I hope, I hope you guys are, I mean, I, I encourage you guys, if you haven't watched it, watch it. There's a part in there that really reemphasizes that the, that the piece that says, if you're free, unless you're identified as a criminal, that was used as a tool in order to circumvent the issue of slavery, the fact that slavery was abolished, because it was the right thing from a social perspective, but the Confederate states who were participating, and it wasn't just Confederate states, but the ones that were participating, and also that had the the um, the the punishment and the things that you see in regards to um, you know the hangings and the lynchings and the and the whippings and things of that nature, that was really something that was uh, uh, seen. Um, very much in those Confederate states, it literally gave them a tool to say, okay, if we cannot cattle these people and and and, cattle, and and identify them as property, if we cannot count them as three-fifths of an individual and collectively build value based upon how many slaves that we have, then in order for us to be able to manage and continue to grow economically, and these are some of the big big box brands that you see right now. You know the the um uh, uh, um you know the the oh, what's Dow Chemical like you there is a a lineage of corporations who families have used slavery in order to to gain a economic upswing of, above and beyond other different entities who are also fighting for economic play. And so this, we're going to keep this conversation going, but it's so critical to understand the foundation. Like sometimes you're free, but you don't even, you're free, but you really are not free. And so the yeah. whole idea of now, how do we criminalize and how do we now um, take individuals and now say, okay, if we can't own you, we're going to criminalize you. That's where the, that's where this came in and, and it started with a whole, uh, this is where it started with a whole entire opportunity. So yeah. I, if you want to kind of go and and continue on e yeah and i was going to say you know the basis of all of it is is like we said at the start is economic is is driven by economics right i mean slavery in and of itself was an institution to provide a cheap labor force to support the agricultural 
uh, industry, right? That that's what it, it what it was. And so when we look at we we abolish slavery, and now we move into you know uh, folks can uh, you know the agriculture industry still needed workers and so then they created another system called sharecropping right so and if you look through the entire history time and time again all the way up until now even with the the prison industrial complex with mass incarceration it's all been about how do we find ways to create this you know cheap labor force to to be the economic you know backbone i mean the the engine to the economic uh 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 economy of this country and we have seen it time and time again and you know one of the things that made this film particularly tough for me to watch is because i it reminded me again how as a as a you know a race we have time and time again fought to overcome whatever mountain was placed in, in front of us just to find that there was another hidden mountain waiting for us on the other side and, you know, we've seen that time and time again. I think that's why we find a lot of weariness even in the cannabis space uh, and, and so on, because it, it, it seems like at, at every turn we're, we're not, you know, we're, we have to learn the system to be able to play in the system. But then that system is still rigged in a way that it, it, it goes against us. And, and it's all about the economy and how can we make, you know, labor cheap and instead yeah. of, you know, figuring out and, and recognizing that, you know, we can all, you know, like they say, all uh, tie, all ties, a uh, tie lift all boats. We can have that type of, uh, you know, uh, system in this country if we recognize that no company is built by the CEO alone. It, it's built by the workers, and if we can learn to get to that that place and understanding, uh, you know, we can even begin to change how we value uh, the labor force. And so yeah. perhaps that moves us away from the predatory style, you know, policies and, 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 and so on that we see um, that lead to mass incarceration and, and so on. Um, but yeah. One thing that jumped out to me, um, you guys, so when you, if we could take you through a timeline of the film, the first thing that comes out in an alarming st statistic that says one out of every four African-American male will serve prison time at one point of, or, or another in their lives. And that's where the journey of the film begins. Because again, the, the, the male, the black male, when it came to slavery, was the, it was the highest earning and it was the highest, um, it was the property that you gained the most out of economically when you were trading of slaves. So the more, so again, you had males who had their family, women and their children, but the higher price entity was that black man. And so again, it started out with the, the stat that even, even further into the film, it pointed out only one in every 17 men, white men will be incarcerated over a lifetime. And so there, there in itself is really a stark contrast where we know that all of this in regards to incarceration was born from slavery and from the fact, and I wanna read this to you guys um, verbatim, so we're told that after the Civil War, the economy of the former Confederate States of America was decimated. Their primary source of income, slaves, were no longer obligated to line Southerners' pockets with their blood, sweat, and tears. Unless, of course, they were criminals, except as punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, reads the loophole in the law. In the first iteration of a Southern strategy, hundreds of newly emancipated slaves were re-enlisted into free legal servitude courtesy of a, of a minor or trumped up charges. The duly convicted part may have been questionable, but by no means did it need to be justifiably proven. And so that's where the journey, where we start with the uh, with pro laws and we start with the Nixon, um, you know, during that time of his presidency, where you see um, this path of watching and seeing the development of the complex prison uh, mass incarceration um, situation that we're talking about right now. Yeah, you know, um, those numbers are alarming, right? And, and one of the things I'm thinking about as I'm watching the film, as I'm even listening to you recite those stats was, you know, 
think about the trauma that that causes for a person to know that, you know, you being one out of four, uh, that could be, you know, you're, you're expected to go to jail. You know what I mean? And when I was growing up, it was like, you know, you're either going to end up in jail or dead by 25. Those, those were kind of the two, you know, uh, er arenas that you could fall into, if you will. And that trauma leads to behaviors and, and, and those behaviors manifest themselves in different ways in, in society. Uh, and then we began to criminalize those behaviors, which led to, again, this mass incarceration. So, you know, and, and I'll make it even more salient because the film talked about it as well. You know, when you're in this depressed, traumatic state, you begin to do what? You begin to look for ways to cope, you know, and, and you you turn to things like crack cocaine and heroin and, and other drugs and so on to try to deal with what is, what is really and truly a mental health issue, but lacking access to, to quality mental health, lacking access to information about how to get help, you go and you find what it seems to, to be what works. And so that behavior then begin, you know, then gets criminalized, right? You know, and instead of treated as a mental health disorder that it is, it gets criminalized and now we get locked up. And then, you know, again, the, I love how the film even talked about it, it wasn't just a conservative or Republican uh, administrations that that really did this. Uh, it, it really was both. It was the Republicans and the Democrats and how this political, you know, battle forcing us to, towards trying to get to the center and, and, you know, win forces us to, to, you know, force the Democrats to look tough on on crime. And so they had to enforce, you know, stricter policies. And now we we've gotten to a place where now that's reversed. Now the, you know, Republicans have to look not so, you know, uh, disconnected from reality of what happens, uh, you know, what has been the result of mass incarceration. That now, you know, everybody's talking about community policing and everybody's talking about different ways of not, you know, continuing to fill prisons. Uh, but again, we have to be skeptical of even those type of. Uh, policies like, you know, uh, parole and probation, which again, the film discussed as well. So th this film really talks on a lot of different, you know, things. And, and you know, it, it's, it's tough because we, you know, it, it's just, it, it's tough. I'll, I'll stop there. So let's talk about, let's start with kind of one area that I thought was really interesting was when you start talking about the Nixon, um, you know, a regime, uh, not regime, but uh, uh, his uh, time in office and so that was the beginning of, and I shouldn't say the beginning of, but um, there's a, a definite connection between um, incarceration, um, you know, um, for individuals of color, but also where we talked about cannabis um, from a, um, and if we can go into that a little bit, um, we saw in the film, it really showed a great, it, it was great because it showed, you know, the fact that America, we only consist of a small percentage of the world we consist of over 40% of those incarcerated population, right? Yeah. And then yeah. it talked in Nixon being, in, again, as the president at the time, his, you know, law and order stance and the ability. And, and again, you have a country that was coming out of Jim Crow laws and you had, so you had that transitioning happening, but you also had um, the Vietnam War going on and you also had, you know, um, um, then you had the rise of the, I love the part about the Black Panther. So you had, you saw Angela Davis in there. She was doing the, you know, again, a black woman who they were like, how do we make sure we get rid of her? We don't need it. We can't hear her voice. And I love, you know, so I love the fact where it started there from a viewpoint of understanding our modern day mass incarceration started with the Nixon, um, you know, presidency and was building on from there. And it was just interesting to see, again, the, the targeting of communities, of seeing, even utilizing cannabis at the time as, and then we know that it was Nixon's administration that said, if we can, if we, if we can, um, if we can incarcerate or if we can, um, you know, look at the hippies and get them, you know, um, identify ways of being able to bust up their, um, their commitment to, um, you know, basically going against the war. And, you know, if we can disrupt the Black family and the Black Panther and all this type of progressive movement, we have the yeah. ability to disrupt everything. And it, and it is intentional. Um, and so don't ever think, you guys, that the 
the the number of people that we saw that came through the war on drugs period, that was so intentional. It served two two things. You had a war that was going on, but you also show the criminality that we ended up having um, these different states and local um, 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 jail and, and, and systems are learning and understanding that you got cheap labor, that you are, I love the part where it talked about all these different things that are made out of people that are in prison. Yeah. And, yeah. and the greater percentage of those people are black men that are coming yeah. from our community. You so know, when, and, okay, I'm sorry, go ahead, I'll stop. No, I, I was gonna say, let me make this connection back to slavery as well, right? So you, you talk about the Nixon era and, and, and you're, you're absolutely right. He, he you know, associated the hippies with marijuana and so that gave them, and then you criminalize marijuana, and that gave you the ability to go in and lock up their leaders and, and disrupt that community. You associate the blacks with heroin, and that gave you the ability to go in and and um, and anti-war. Um, and then, you know, you can go and lock up those leaders and you disrupt that community as well. But what that is really reminiscent of is when during slavery time, when those slaves who were causing trouble or getting people to get organized or you know getting ready to create a rebellion they were sold off ripped away from their families you know disconnecting the father the central figure of the family from those families and think about the the lasting generational traumatic uh uh impact that that had and so then you fast forward to you know the nixon era and now we got this war on drugs and you're right you know it, it reminds me of modern day times at very few points in time in history where we've had so many, you know, global crises going on. You know, like you said, the Vietnam War was going on. You had, um, you know, the decriminalization. You had the heroin epidemic coming online. You got all of these different things, you know. So the, these things tied into it. And, um, you know, it, it really was, you know, Nixon who, I guess, coined it from a political standpoint of the war on drugs but for him it was kind of more you know tongue-in-cheek like we're, we're just tough on crime but then yeah. it was his predecessor bush who actually actualized that and, and made that a real thing and made you know uh and, and gave states the ability and and really the incentive to begin to start these type of uh uh you know harsh uh penalties and stuff that we see that culminated in Bill Clinton with mandatory minimums and, and all of those different things. So we've seen it, you know, in progressively starting back from the late 50s on to the, the 90s, where the infrastructure that created mass incarceration was a progressive movement, just like when in 1937 with the cannabis industry, if all we did was outlaw cannabis or marijuana at the time, then all we would need to do now is change the law and make it legal. But it was a miseducation. It was the propaganda. It was the policies that followed that, that creates the, the work that we do now to try to dismantle that and create a system that is, is equitable and fair. Fair. One thing about it is, remember in the film, they talked about the Southern strategy. So this was within the Republic Party, Republican Party, the, the Southern strategy was basically articulated and it was um, D um, Duvernay, she, she, she coined it, it gave me chills in my bones. And, and so the, I wanna read a section to you, but the legal perception by 13th is to, de to demonstrate how the civil rights movement and the spelling of the end of the Jim Crow era caused the white power structure to ask, what can we put in, it, in its place? One, right? How can we continue to segregate the answer was the war on crime and the war on drugs. They were born together in the Nixon era and they were always called for, let's put them behind bars. DuVernay plays astonishing record testimony from John Ehrlichman, the assistant to the president of domestic affairs, which he admits that the government created the crackdown. And this is what, again, he is referring to the targeted left-wing descendants and black people, but always with the excuse of fighting the drug scourge. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Asked er Ehrlichman, of course we did. And again, the war on drugs, I remember to this day, you guys remember this, I, I remember this, you know, say no to drug. Nancy Reagan came out with her whole entire say no to drug. Dare, remember the commercial that took the, that you had the skillet pan and it, he cracked the egg and he was like, this is your, this is your brain on drugs. It scared. It's, excuse me. Can I cuss? It scared the crap out of me. 
like really we grew up like I was someone that I didn't consume in in, in my households like if you use anything any type of drug mar anything you're going to jail you're a bum you like it was never talked about wellness and feeling better and medicine all these type of things and it's just again it was using this particular cannabis as well as of course heroin and LSD and some other different things um but pardon me but it was truly in our as 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 a woman who's 50 now as i was growing up all of these things were put in your brain and imagine so this is what i want you guys to imagine imagine if this is coming and it's deliberately hitting your community where you're seeing your people in your community they're going to jail they're being targeted you're seeing the the um campaigns at school they're like dare don't do drugs and then we get we and then we bring in in 2015, 2016, 2017, 18, 19, 2020, 2021, now it's okay. You can use cannabis as medicine. This is why you have to have advocacy. This is why we do what we do because you cannot square those two thoughts up. When you've been trained a certain way, you've been taught, you have, you have absorbed information a certain way that if you, that one plus one equals two, in your mind, you can't tell me now that one plus one um, equals four. It, it, it still equals two, even though now we're in a new generation where we can say, hey, now two plus two equals four. It's just really interesting, just the, you know, the gradualness of a mindset. Some numbers for you guys. And then e, I, I want to hear from you. Um, Duvernay, during her, during the film, she flashes back. The, here's some numbers to think about. In 1970, it was 357,292 people incarcerated. By 1980, that, that had um, gone up to 513,900. In 1990, it was 1.17 million. And currently there's 2.3 million people that are incarcerated. 40% of, even though African Americans make up 6% of the population, we can make up 40% of those prisoners um, that are currently in, incarcerated right now. Talk about that. What does that mean? It, it's a sobering numbers when you think about it. Yeah, you know, um, again, I go back to what it means is that we, we're dealing with uh, a tremendous amount of trauma in society that we, we don't speak about, that we don't talk about. Um, you know, I, I don't think just of those people who that 40 percent of people who are incarcerated, you know, just like when we think about a military vet that goes off to war, we don't just think about that vet. We think about his family, we, you know, that, that he's leaving behind, uh, he or she, I'm sorry, uh, is, is leaving behind. Uh, it's the same thing uh, when we talk about mass incarceration. Um, it's not just the person who's sitting in a, in a jail cell. Uh, it's their families. It, it's that little girl who's grown up without uh, their father or that little boy who, you know, doesn't have that example of how to be a man. Um, you know, it's that mother who's struggling to make ends meet working a, a nine to five, uh, you know, job and in a society that requires you to have two incomes just to make ends meet. Um, we, we, we don't talk about those things uh, and the real uh, pervasiveness of that, that whole world, war on drugs and war on crime. Uh, it, it didn't just impact the one person who got locked up. It impacted communities. Um, it impacted the way Family. that people see the world, right? Like you, you talk about how, you know, we, we see all of this over you. You know, I remember D.A.R.E. I went through a D.A.R.E. program. I was anti-cannabis all the way up until my junior year of college. Like I, I was very much against it, you know, and vocally so. Um, but I went through all of that. So you saw all of that. And, and you see now this legal industry going on. And it's like, well, wait a minute. You know, how, how is that even okay? And then I think about the same thing with, you know, the, the trauma that people are, are experiencing and how does that manifest over time? Like I didn't grow up with my father. It wasn't because he was uh, incarcerated. Just simply my father, my mother didn't work out. So we, I didn't grow up with him. That has a impact on who I am as a person today. So imagine the impact it has on someone who saw their, their father not, not just disappear, you know, one didn't come back one day. But the police bust in their house, break down the door and drag their father out to jail. 
Like imagine the trauma that that child has gone through and how that will manifest in their life and how they'll show up on someone's job and be labeled as an angry black woman or, yeah. or be labeled as a potential threat. You know, if something goes missing, let's go ask the black guy. Imagine how these things end up, you know, manifesting over time and, and not even just in our in the black community. Imagine, you know, again, they talked about it in the film, how when the media shows nothing but black men being paraded into jails, what does that do to the psyche of the rest of the, the American society? What do you think about the black male? You know, I, I often talk about the reason why, you know, police officers, um, you know, who have, uh, you know, taken lives of black men in the, in the streets it's largely because of fear. And, and it's a fear that's not like, you know, you, you just fearing whether or not you get into a, a physical altercation with someone, but the type of fear that if you were walking in the woods and were confronted by, you know, a predator uh, animal, that type of fear is the type of fear that people in this country walk around with for about black men. It's the same type of thing that, you know, for me as a father of two young black men, it brings me to tears because I know how the world is going to see them. I know that very early on in their lives, they're going to be met with a reality about the way that this world sees them. And I think this video really, you know, the, the documentary really, really broke that down. I'll, I'll, I'll go on further, um, just kind of moving through the movie and just giving commentary. Um, I thought something that I wasn't familiar with and didn't realize and understand was the power of Alex. And Alex stands for, um, it is the American Legislative Exchange Council. And I don't know if you guys remember seeing yeah, that. Yeah, I'm familiar. Um, but it's a lobbying club, and it's been around basically for over 40 years now. And it was started, I mean, literally seeing a lawmaker submit language for a bill and Alex logo is still on the paper they submitted because they forgot to take their logo off. I didn't realize how a lobbying group could have so much influence over lawmakers. And it was just the rise of Alex. And of course, um, it's A-L-E-C. Of course, they deny culpability. They denied um, being the people behind the scenes, making laws to keep people incarcerated. Um, however, it was very interesting that as Alex was growing, you know, some of the same, um, you know, they represented other different interests and entities like uh, the Corrections Corporation of America. So if you don't know that as time went on and as we talked about, you know, President Clinton, who, again, you know, the reason why folks were like vote your conscience and not vote for a person or vote for a color is because you had someone like President Clinton who came back many years later and said, he made a mistake. He said, I made a mistake. Um, I over, I, I over legislate. I was not looking out for, I mean, he just was wrong. He was wrong. He passed mass incarceration bill, which is um, the crime bill of 1994. Um, it asked for additional funds for policing. It made over policing and mass incarceration even worse. It did the, I remember this three strikes and you're out. I remember people yeah. being, and, and that, that was all by Alec as well. I, yeah. I'm not, you know, I, I like Bill Clinton as an orator. I think he's one of the greatest orators of our time. I also think he's one of the greatest political minds of our time as well. But with that in mind, he's a politician. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I got, he, well, you know, he apologized, right? Yeah, you know, was, folks in the film was like, well, he knew what he was doing. And, you right, know, you right. Know, and, 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 and I think and I'm very smart man. And so politically, you know, politics will make you do a lot of things. And that's why exactly. I'm, I'm fortunate in my role is that when trying to get drawn into politics, I don't. I can personally support something, but drawing my organization, drawing our advocacy into politics, I don't want to. That's why we as as uh, as um, advocates and leaders of this organization, you will hear us from time to time say we got to reach across the aisle. We got to go and talk to the Republican. We have to talk to the Democrat. We have to talk to the independent. We got to shake hands with people that we normally don't shake hands with because policy doesn't happen in a silo. And, no. you know, if you look you at know, it, as smart as I'm and I'll finish this last sentence, yeah. as smart as um, Bill Clinton as a president as, and, you know, his pedigree, you have to kind of think in your mind, this guy knew that what I'm doing is could set so much on fire. And it did. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and here's the thing, though, you know, Alec happened to be the fall guy on, on this case. Right. And Alec has major 
power. But there, he, the, Alec is not the only organization that has, you know, politicians in the room with big corporations. There, there, you know, a, a lot of different lobbying type efforts like that around the world in country clubs and golf resort, you know, golf clubs all over the, the country in which the same activity that took place in Alec uh, take place in, 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 in on both sides, Democrats and Republicans, you know, yeah. uh, that it, 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 it is not a single party issue or, or at all. But I think it boils down to the question of, uh, you know, for me, um, you know, when we elevate corporations and businesses to the status of a person, uh, we encourage that type of behavior. We encourage, you know, businesses who are driven by monetary uh, goals to to push their agenda. A, a, a democracy, and you've heard me say this all the time, is a battle of interest. Yeah, it's a battle of interest. And if we elevate a corporation and a company to a person and, and give that, you know, give them that status of, of having a legitimate interest in that regard, then we see the type of things where policies are made that are in interest of, uh, of business and not in the interest of, uh, you know, citizens. And so I, I think the real the real thing that we have to think about as everyday citizens and um, you know, Americans in this country, how are we giving rise to our voice, um, you know, it, with issues? How do we galvanize the attention of politicians? You know, because at the end of the day, you know, corporations do it with their, their money, right? They, they're able to go fund people's campaigns so that they can campaign and get back in office. But ultimately, we have the power of the vote as, as, as people. And so it's our vote that they go spend those campaign dollars on to go get. So when we can find ways to leverage our voice as people and, and make the conversation, uh, you know, more about what our goals and, and so on are, I think we start to see more fair and equitable, um, you know, goals. Because, again, those goals, it, whereas it, as an individual level, we're not, we may be driven by economic goals, but at the end of the day, those economic goals are a means to an end, to feed our family, to put a roof over our head, to, you know what I mean, not to live lavish you know, lifestyles and fly on private jets and pay employees, you know, dirt, you know, pay them nothing while so, you get, yeah. So I'll, I'll say this, don't let the rapper lifestyle that you see that sometimes commonality that's out there, that is that is a very small microcosm of the entire community and the entire race. That is not how we, uh, how we interpret. We have more people that are focused on family and focused on how to do better and and, and I, you know, as we talk about this and, you know, seeing Bill Clinton, and of course, Hillary Clinton, as she was running for presidency and having to kind of to answer to some of those harms. As we get towards the end of the movie, we see this gentleman who is incarcerated and basically, you know, the whole entire prison mass incarceration and the privatized the privatizing of prisons. These companies were getting paid for beds, regardless if you put someone in those beds or not. And the economics of that doesn't add up. So you have individuals that are pushing our judicial system is even pushing individuals who are not guilty of a crime to plead out in order to serve time, a, a lesser time, scaring them to say, listen, if you don't plead, you're going to um, get, you know, you're going to be found guilty and go to jail. And there was a point in the film, and this is where I broke down, where there was a young man he said, I'm not guilty. Why should I plead guilty? And so many times, and this is why when we talk about release and repair the harm, we've seen so many black men who have been charged with crimes they have they are not guilty of, or they may have been guilty of one thing, but not the other. And in order to try to get back home and to be able to get back to a normal routine, they, they feel like you have to succumb to the fact that there's no way out for me. I can't afford it. It's an economic conversation that goes on in regards to prison because those people that do the same crime that are economically in a position to hire the right attorney and to be able to understand how to work through it, they do. Those people that don't, i.e. the black community, they don't. They go serve time. And the position this young man who literally went to jail, well, he, he didn't plead out and therefore they kept him you know, in jail. He couldn't pay the, the um, bail to get out. So he's in jail for almost three years waiting to go to trial and to see what he went through in order to survive in jail. He went in as a young young adult, a young man with 
um, just was um, sensitive and, and so, um, you know, just in, not mm -hmm. in, but innocent, right? And he came out just jaded. He was been he had been, you know, sexually assaulted. He had been physically assaulted. He came out as a he came out as a criminal. And so in the movie, you always kept seeing the word criminal, criminal. Like, and, and you put them in a position. And this is where I had my breakdown and kind of it made me think about my kid, my son, who is twenty two years old. This young man came out. They found him that he was he was innocent. And he came out, he had been in jail for three years and literally came out home to his family and two years later committed suicide. And it's a, just a life gone that didn't have to be that way. And that's when I looked at, and on the, on the film, they would focus in on his face and then they would zoom in more and they would zoom in more. And I looked at this little, this young man's face and that could be my kid. It could be Eric's kid. Yeah. And to, at the end of the day, guys, we want to have family. We want to create legacy. We want to create generational wealth, wealth, and especially in cannabis, because the opportunity is here. And that's why it gets so personal as we view these things. And I don't know. That's why I got so personal for myself. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm gonna it, jump in really quick. I'm so sorry. We only have like 13 minutes left, and we have a couple of questions. If that's okay. Yeah, and, and okay. I jump out to another uh, thing after this as well. So yeah, so okay. Okay. we'll wrap up and then let's answer. Let's answer some questions. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that young man's story was so uh, touching, but I think it raises a point that I, I don't, you know, obviously we won't have enough time to discuss here today. But uh, in, in the cannabis industry, the focus has largely been on expungement, right? For those people who have been taken out of prisons. Um, but we can't forget, you know, th this gentleman's story really raises the, the point of we have forgotten about the people we've sent to this this hell on earth and what happens to them uh you know black men just in general are walking through the american society uh largely dehumanized by the rest of society uh but those folks in, in jail we have completely stripped them of, of being human we don't see them as human and so we we that then makes it okay for us to support policies that are quote unquote tough on crime uh, and, and so on. And, but this is what happens. You either plead out and now you, you have the record of you've done something, even though you haven't, yep. or, or you take your chances and you go in and you get hardened and you come out a, a, a real criminal um, and, and you are ready to take your life. Uh, those are some very bleak uh, uh, you know, choices, uh, but I think it begs the question that we really got to look at what's happening inside our correctional facilities just as much as what happens when people come out. Yeah. Um, the last thing I'll say, and I'll make it 30 seconds or less, and then let's, let's talk questions is that the end of the film really brings home modern day, what we're seeing in regards to people um, that have been with the over policing, um, you know, the black lives matter and talking about that movement and how important it is to raise the conscious level of individuals. And to this day, last year, that are being um, literally killed. Um, you know, it, it talks about Eric Garner. Um, again, hearing his voice say, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And, you know, someone saying, you know, F if you can't breathe. Um, our lives, the whole Black Lives Matter movement, and I'll end on this, wasn't about the fact that your life doesn't matter. It was saying our lives matter. We see that we are dying at the hands of what if it's incarceration, if it's over policing, and we want you guys to put eyeballs to the fact that this is happening so that we can all have lives that matter and not just it be one person that matters or one race that matters, but really putting eyeballs to the issue at hand that there were extreme, there, extreme measures need to be taken in order to shed a light on the fact that you had these individuals that were just losing their life and, um, and, it, and, it, and there's a better way. So um, thank you guys for, you know, just listening to us, our commentary. Um, we're pretty passionate about it. And let's, let's answer some questions. Great. Thank you. So this first one is a little long, but I'm going to try to consolidate it a little bit. So um, it's kind of referring to what you guys are talking about with uh, CCA and ALEC. And so how do we stay vigilant as a country to encourage true progressive reform, especially as Black people continue to be killed by law enforcement uh, since the film was released. 
That includes things like restorative justice and race conscious policing. Want to take that first, Eric, or? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's extremely difficult, right? Because again, nobody knew Alec existed and the groups that were supporting it and benefiting from it until all of this came out, right? Like I wouldn't have known to go research Alec and see who they were and their impact in policy. So, um, you know, we're, we're up against a very tough, you know, opponent in, in that regard. Um, but I think it, it to me, um, and, and just my own journey in the space with working with Roz and, and, and for MM, the more you are engaged and, and are part of the process, uh, the more you see, uh, I, I think to me, the more hopeful I get because you, you are very much in the process and able to work on it. But, you know, it's a it's a rigged process and it's tough and it's long nights and uh, so on. But I would say stay uh, as informed as you can be um, and and participate, you know, talk to your elected officials in your local areas at your state level, um, at your national level. Uh, not just pay attention during election time, but, you know, get on their calendar and talk to them about the issues that are important to you uh, and make sure that your voice is heard. I'll give you some real tangible things to do. Um, if you want to, every every state has their state website for different bills that are coming through during each legislation session. Really, guys, policy is where it's at. We have a good friend of ours, Representative Carlos Guillermo Smith who over the last four years has tried to introduce a decriminalization bill in Florida. And every time it starts getting some traction, it falls apart and it ends up dying in committee, right? Well, if we had more people that had more eyeballs to it, you have to know what's going on from a, from a policy perspective because his bill could really be another catalyst to change um, decrim laws when it came to cannabis. And that's just one area. So what you can do is two things. If you wanna, if you wanna watch uh, and track bills that are going on in your state you just go to your local your state you know government website and when you go to bill tracker bill b-i-l-l -L, tracker you can actually track bills based upon keywords so you could put in um you could put in um criminal reform um um you could put in um um uh, um you could put in uh social social justice criminal reform um put in criminal justice criminal justice, you can put in some keywords or what have you. Anytime a bill that comes out of like the, um, you know, we have the, what, what's the committee that uh, Senator Bracey had? He was chair of the criminal, criminal justice. justice. So yeah. anytime you get a bill that comes out of the criminal justice committee or may come out of a social committee, but it has anything to do with um, criminal justice reform, social justice reform, things of that nature, you'll get a ping in your email box and you'll be able to see what's, what's going on. So that's number one. Number two is go to Google, Google this. How do I set up a Google alert? How do you set up Google alert? When it, follow that direction and put in for your state. If you live in, you know, if you live in Georgia, put in Georgia and then put in keywords like criminal justice, social justice reform. If you want to follow cannabis and marijuana policy, put in marijuana, put in cannabis. Literally every time there's a news story, every time there is any type of, um, activity from a media perspective in your state with your keywords attached to it, you will get an email and it helps you to stay up on what's going on. We have to be informed. I never knew this stuff until I got into advocacy into cannabis. <clears throat> I just go, you vote yeah. and that's it. And you walk away. Let, let me give you one third one to add to that. Go participate in your local government. The most important level of government for all of our daily lives is your local government. Get involved know who your commissioner is and, and pay attention. Yep. Great. Thank you. Appreciate you guys answering. Now we got one more um, before we close it out. Do you both, uh, you both can answer this one. Do you feel like the people that kind of created the mem the amendment found a loophole after it was put into practice or do you think that they originally meant to do that? Like, was it intentional? I think it was people, intentional. Pe people who do policy work are extremely meticulous. I do not believe that that loophole was put in there by chance at all. Um, I think, in fact, it, it, it was more, well, more than more, most likely what happened was in order for the entire amendment to pass, that piece of the language had to be there. Um, you know, Roz mentioned the decriminalization bill. 
uh, Carlos Guillermo Smith happens to, I live in his district. And every year that we, like you said, you got traction. One year they even tried to attach it to one of the most controversial bills in our state surrounding medical marijuana in order to get support from the other side. It was like, hey, listen, we know y'all don't like this, but we'll add your little decriminalization if you will, you know, vote for this and, and support this, which again was a non-starter. So, uh, no, I don't think it was uh, by chance at all. Um, before we wrap up, I want to ask Roz a, a question. What were your thoughts? What went through your head uh, when watching the film and they showed all of the leaders uh, of the different civil rights leaders and so on and how they had been treated uh, by law enforcement throughout time? What yeah. were your thoughts? Well, mine was, you know, we glorify and we think that it was easy during those days and um, really what their, their point about Martin Luther King and about how there was a lot of bumping of heads, not only, of course, with main, with the government, but also within his own community, right? And so um, it was just amazing to see the footage. Like you, you hear in our community about Angela Davis and you hear about MLK and you hear, uh, man, I just watched a piece on Fannie Lou Hamer on PBS. And if you guys don't know who Fannie Lou Hamer is, Go research her, Fannie Lou, L-O-U, Hamer. I had no idea this woman was a, she was literally like the, she was the godmother of civil rights even before MLK. And so um, it was just amazing to see um, these figures that we know and we've learned through history to hear their voice and their time and to see them. And you know, I'll tell you what, one thing, it, it scared me because I was like, Okay, so he so MLK talked about the fact that he was like, I don't know how long I'll be on this earth, but I'm going to work and I'm just going to keep working. And when we I got chills in my body, when we're doing that, Eric and I, we like it made me think about like we're very vocal on our support and about diversity, equity and inclusion. And what about if that was I mean, we are a modern day. Don't I'm not comparing myself. Don't get me wrong. I'm not. I'm nowhere close to MLK or Fannie Lou Hamer, any of those stuff. But speaking out on a topic that is not comfortable to speak out on, it gave me a pause in regards to what I'm doing. And God willing, he will allow me to live a long life to see the evolution of this industry and the inclusion that I'm working for. But if, if something were to happen, I would just be like, you know, it just it just made you pause. So I don't know. Yeah. That, that, that was a, the same for me, uh, just seeing it. And uh, it definitely sent chills through my body, um, you know. But, you know, the, the fight must go on and we, and we must continue this. And, um, you know, I was going to play a little audio clip, but I'll just kind of paraphrase it. Um, and it, it's a parallel between the cannabis industry and I think and civil rights and, and mass incarceration. My, one of my uh, great, uh, you know, mentors is on the wall behind me, James Baldwin, right? And he did a debate with a guy by the name of William Buckley at Cambridge, and I think in the late 70s. And he ended his piece of the debate where he talks about how, you know, Black people are not wards or charity of the state, um, but they are a part of the very people who built this country. And until the citizens of this country realize that uh, there can hardly be any hope for an American dream because he says by the, the mere fact of the people who exist in this system who do not have access to it, their existence threatens the entire system. And I say that same thing when we talk about cannabis and people who come from the legacy market. We can create this industry but by the and by the very existence of people who exist, you know, that built this industry and don't have access to it, they will threaten the very industry that we're building. So we have to create space uh, for those communities and those individuals uh, who are bore the brunt of the war on drugs and the war on poverty. Great. I think that's a great way to close it out, Eric. Way to drop the mic on that one. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Eric and Roz, for, for joining us today. I really appreciate it. And thank you for everyone for joining on the live stream. Uh, this is recorded, so we'll share it with you all um, to have. And you can share with your teams and we'll share it internally. And if we have 
any other questions, um, we'll have Olivia send them over to you and we'll we'll share them with the group. Um, go, thank go you. Watch, and, and kudos to you guys, you know, but go watch the film. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you all. We'll see you. All right.